A lot of big games from a playoff perspective on the Week 15 main daily fantasy football slate, but not a lot of big totals on the board for this week with no totals above 50 over at FanDuel Sportsbook for Week 15, which means we might have to get a little bit funky because the two highest totals both involve massive, massive spreads. We got to decide, do we stack those games? Do we have bringbacks there? Do we go to tighter spreads and lower totals? It's not easy. It's the same complications for everyone, but we'll see how things break down here. We'll get you set for the Week 15 main slate and hopefully lead you on the right path towards profitability. This is the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast powered by Number Fire. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Brandon Gadula. He is the senior managing editor of NumberFire.com. Brandon, week 15 is coming up. How are you doing today? Better now. Um, right before we went live, the last thing I heard from Jim was, oops. Yeah. Then- so, like, we, we were on YouTube, and I sometimes forget the order of doing things. Because for covering the spread, I press live and then quickly press the intro so that it, like, meshes up well. For this one, people are watching it live. So... If I mess it up, it'll just be us sitting there on a screen with no intro. It'll look super stupid because I'll be like, you know, fiddling around, you know, just doing whatever. Um, I almost went live without the intro because I start the intro first for Heat Check. I almost (laughs) said covering the spread, it went entering the podcast. I'm very organized, very prepared. Week 15 brain. Very ready. No, I've been distracted this week because I decided to build out a model for betting totals um, and I think I spent most of my day yesterday doing that. I did prepare for like the the slate as well, uh, but I was really excited. I was like back testing like ROIs based on what edges I have and stuff like that. So uh, I'm very prepared, very ready, very locked in, and definitely not going to mess up anything else the rest of the way. Well, I think it's good. I, I know you'll like ask me about the slate overview, like, but this week it's almost like nothing's perfect. So I just need to like. <laughs> we shouldn't be some- either. <laughs> Like pick some games to stack, like yeah, because there's not like you're you're sifting through five or six really good games and, and figuring out. It's like it's probably gonna come come down to like which games you settle on to stack, mm-hmm. and so we'll talk about those and talk around things. But not a whole lot of screaming value. I think it might be another week where receiver in the flex is viable to save some salary because there may or may not be some value at running back. Yeah, as of right now, nothing concrete. So. It really yeah, does depend not. on your tolerance level for imperfection at running back among value plays, but also <laughs> yeah. what transpires in terms of uh, injury reports throughout the week. We'll break down key spots to watch, uh, which guys we got our eyes on, and how we'd handle things based on the way injury reports break throughout the week. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. We, of course, are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just search for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your your podcast and while you're there if you like what you hear leave us a rating and review as well also live on the handle youtube page mondays and thursdays at 10 a.m eastern with only a handful of monday night football games remaining this season fanduel and visa are coming together to make sure the excitement surrounding monday nights is at an all-time high introducing monday night perfect picks presented by visa a free-to-play contest on fanduel that gives you a chance to win a share of ten thousand dollars in cash prizes courtesy of visa here's how it works you'll be presented with 10 questions sent around on-field action for monday night's nfl game Fans who answer the most questions correctly win their share of the $10,000 prize pool. It is that easy. The contest is now live. So head to FanDuel.com slash free slash contest slash Visa Perfect Picks and make your picks before Monday night. That's FanDuel.com slash free slash contest slash Visa Perfect Pick. No purchase necessary. Age and location restrictions apply. Void or prohibited. See full terms at FanDuel.com. Visa and its financial institutions have not sponsored or offered this promotion in in any way. Let's dig in now, like you said, to the slate overview here for week number 15. And Brandon, I think for me, it is it's a slate where there are a lot of desirable studs. Maybe not like a lot like in terms of volume, but the studs that are desirable, to me at least, are very desirable, and I want to get there. So it to me, it comes down to 
deciding if it's worth it to take shots on value plays in order to get there, like jam in both Derrick Henry and Jamar Chase in the same lineup. Can I do that? Yes, I can. But it does force me to, you know, make some consolations. So to me, it comes down to that. Making consolations, deciding how heavy I want to go on those studs and more. What is the slate overview to you? Yeah, it's pretty similar. It's it's basically trying to figure out what are the odds that the big names make us regret not using them mm-hmm. because if they go off uh, and you need to have them in your lineup, um, you're going to have some value plays who just naturally don't put up a lot of points to begin with. Uh, but I don't, I don't like, I don't think it's even that easy because yeah. the mid range everywhere is like, not that great. Like the mid range at running back is pretty bad. Like the 7,000 range for me is what I consider the mid range at running back. Mm-hmm. Um, basically 8,000 up is a stud and below seven is, is like more in the value tier, but uh, none of those guys are really flawless. Like Miles Sanders salary is really high. Alvin Kamara, we can talk about uh, maybe being viable, but the fact that Kamara is not a slam dunk at 76 against the Falcons at home is, is like, it's whole on conversation, but like mm. Isaiah Pacheco's got his issues. Zeke, James Connors on of a night. Like these guys are not. I'm gonna say it again. They're, they're not slam dunk plays. You can't just build around them and feel like I'm just gonna take these three of these guys and feel good about it. So, yeah. I, like it's it's like a combination of making sure we get ceiling, but also there's not an alternative of like. I'll miss out on the studs so that I can just pepper that mid range. Cause I don't really think that's a great strategy either. Yeah. I think that that's a part of it too. Part of the reason why I'm so infatuated with Henry and chase is because the opportunity cost in getting to, you know, like on the mid range and stuff like that um, is not as big. Like, you know, I think the gap between the studs and the, the mid range is bigger this week. That's a better way to phrase that um, of the guys in the 7,000 range. Like you mentioned, There are seven guys in that range um, who are like healthy and stuff Mm -hmm. of those seven. Three of them are with quarterbacks who did not start the season for them. So Colt McCoy for James Conner, Mike White, like he's better than Zach Wilson, but is he a desirable quarterback? Probably not, at least not for me. Um, And also in a timeshare with Michael Carter and then Camaras with Andy Dalton, maybe better than Jameis. I don't think so, but like they do. So I don't know. It's it's weird. They all are very flawed. I do like Travis Etienne a lot, um, mm. but like we know how the past couple weeks have gone. So like there are paths to failure there too. So even the guys I like are imperfect. Um, so it's it's difficult. I do think that there are some value plays worth discussing at running back, um, even without getting injury news to break in our favor. But we'll break that down and uh, dive into that throughout the podcast for today. Let's start things off, though, with the injury section. We're seeing backup quarterbacks most likely for both sides of the Broncos and the Cardinals. Kyler Murray tore his ACL. He is done for the year. Russell Wilson is practiced Wednesday and is in concussion protocol. We'll likely get the Broncos with no Corlin Sutton here. And Brett Redman played okay in his one game uh, filling in for Russ, but does the quarterback play in this game, make it a cross off across the board? Um, In the end, almost. Yeah. I I would have considered like mini stacks here just because the names are good enough. Um, But the salaries are too high for just about everyone. I think the only outlier there is Greg Dulcich, just because he's a really good tight end. Uh, The salary is 5,600 Arizona allowing a catch rate over expectation of 8.1 points which is easily the highest of the position 1.87 yards per route run to tight ends that they face, like easily the highest as well. Um, I think Travis Kelsey is a priority, which makes it really difficult because I'm with you with Henry and Jamar chase as being like their own priorities. But um, I, th- I think everyone's out, but Dulcich really because of the, where the salaries are. Yeah, if Judy remained 65, I could be there because, again, Rippon was fine in that one start against the Jets, and they're, they're a tough defense. So I think that was that was solid. Um, Dulcich, the low salary, I think is is viable. Uh, you got Evan Ingram there at 55. The problem is, so I put in, I was tinkering to see if I could do a, a Henry Chase lineup, um, and I can, and I just put in best play I could afford each position. And doing so left me with three Jags. And so I've got to like, you know, navigate my way around that. So yeah. I think I'll naturally wind up at 
Dulcich a bit. Cole Komet's there at 53. Get me off Ingram as well. But mm-hmm. um, it's uh, too many Jags will be a theme with the podcast for me. Josh Once Jacobs. Again, I yeah, mean, I what, Josh, what, was our, right? what was our tagline last week? Like, we're going to be on the Jags. Yeah. Yeah. We were on the Jags. I forgot about that. Huh. Yeah. I should have done more of it in my actual lineups. Fun stuff. Uh, Josh Jacobs, able to get in a limited session Wednesday with the finger injury he suffered last week. He was in a non-contact jersey, so I don't think this means he's a lock to play. If Jacobs does play, probably okay to treat him pretty close to his normal self. I would note that with Hunter Renfro and Darren Waller back, we'll talk about that in a second, might lose some targets. But uh, if Jacobs cannot go, are you looking at any other pieces in this backfield? Uh we like haven't really seen a whole game from Jacobs where he's been limited to like get a read on what exactly they they would want to do. We've seen like right. Samir White kind of be the name that was supposed to pop off, um, but like Amir Abdullah has been relevant. I don't really. This is one of those spots like we talk about this a, a good amount. It's like there might be opportunity, but we have to guess who's going to get it. We can guess wrong and yeah. just be flat out having a zero. Or we could just guess and have it be 45% for each of those guys. Um, like maybe Brandon Bolden. Yeah. Like gets like 10%. he's gotten some offensive snaps. He's not yeah. just a special teams guy with them. So I, yeah. I think that Abdullah would be almost a lock to get the passing game work, which means we're relying on Zamir White to like go nuts on the ground. Kind of tough. Um, so I, I'd, I'd be okay backing off, uh, passing a pieces there again, Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro designated to return from IR does not mean they'll be active, but they could be Renfro's salary is 54 Waller is 51 facing off of the Patriots. Any interest in either if they suit up this week? Um, I think it's an interesting week. Uh, one of my trends actually is uh, about this team against mm-hmm. tough defenses. I, I don't think that those guys are out of play uh, for this. I think week. Waller specifically is in play 51. Yeah. Look, I mean, we've been here before. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. as someone and no one cares about your season long teams, but like I've had Darren Waller on my season long teams for the past two years now. And he's just been sitting in the IR slot for all of that time. So yeah. I got to go overcome that bias. Yep. It is. Like the games where he's been healthy, which has been like three. So I don't know how I have a memory of using him, but, We'll see how it goes. Uh, Tyler Boyd and T. Higgins both logged limited sessions on Wednesday because, of course, T. Higgins is limited. The uh, I still think Boyd's going to miss uh, based on earlier reports and that finger injury. I have no idea how to read the Tiggins, the Tiggins, T. Higgins side of this. Um, the Bucks likely to be without Vita Vea for this game, which I think does boost the Bengals offense. We'll talk about them in the trend section. They are annoying. Dontrell Hilliard mispracticed Wednesday with a neck neck issue. His absence helped Derrick Henry get five targets in week number 14. Traylon Burks also mispracticed and is still in concussion protocol. We'll talk about them in the bookmaker section. Damian Harris and Jacoby Myers both got in limited sessions for the Patriots on Wednesday. Reminder Stevenson, Devontae Parker were both sidelined. Parker concussion, Stevenson ankle. It seems like Harris is trending toward playing while Stevenson very much up in the air. If we get Harris without Stevenson, would Harris be on your radar at 65? He would. Yeah. Um, I comp a lot of guys to Damien Harris. I've talked in the past about not loving Damien Harris for DFS, but we got to remember that like at the beginning of the season, Harris had like a 40 ish percent snap rate um, and was a, a thorn in the side of Ramondre Stevenson who once Harris got hurt, uh, this team just leaned on Stevenson. So it's very clear that they love Stevenson, but they liked Harris enough to keep that in check from the start of the season, which I think is relevant. Um, and so I would assume that Harris has a pretty substantial role. And look, I don't, I don't really see a lot of great plays in the six thousand range of running back. I'm willing to. Uh, take a guy who might not catch a lot of passes at that salary just to help me round out lineups. So again, I I don't like to play guys because of their salary. I think it's a little bit more than that for Harris. I think that the the team does like him. And the pass catching is not a zero. He's had multiple targets in six separate games this year, six out of nine that he's played and he's left two of those early with injury. So he's not a zero in that regard. We know that they'll be willing to give him goal line work. Um, Obviously, Harris, uh, Kevin Harris, and then uh, Pierre Strong played fine Monday, but the fact that they have 
gone so hard at Ramondre when Harris has been out, I think tells you what you need to know. Um, so if we get Harris with no Ramondre, I'll be very, very interested in Harris at 65. Probably a core play for me at mm -hmm. that point if that happens. The yeah. Saints place Mark Ingram on injured reserve with a knee injury. Alvin Kamara's issues have been better without Ingram like from a snap rate perspective, but as you pointed out to me, like the actual like usage usage has not been better. Um, they're facing the Falcons this week. Good matchup, but also like bad vibes. Where are you on the saints specifically Camara? All right. I mean, yeah, I mean with, with Camara, like the salary is tempting. It's weird to say again, like that 76 is too much to ask for. Yeah. Um, I just like this, this is weird because he has a five touchdown game, or was it six? Six. Uh, um, it was around year. the holidays too, so the Camara holiday narrative. But was it Christmas Day? I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, because yeah, I made the joke of the VI in his name for the Roman numeral six, so that, that's it's all coming back to me, Jim. What's not coming back though, is, I think, is like the true ceiling of of Camara within this offense. I don't really see a path for him to turn out a ton of yardage. I think he could score multiple times. I don't really know if he can score three times. Like, I don't know if this team will even take advantage of this matchup well enough. These teams just don't run a lot of plays combined, both yeah. sides. So, like, it's one of those spots where maybe the optimizers like him a good amount, but I don't think I'm going to end up getting there as a primary play. Yeah. And I'm not going to stack this game either. So, I'm going to just hope that Kamara has just an okay game. So I am also not like super, I don't know. I would say turned on by, but that sounds weird. That's <laughs> phrasing. Um, I'm also not super enthusiastic about using Kamara. The counterpoint would be if I were playing devil's advocate here against myself um, is the games in which Kamara didn't do a lot were Tampa Bay, great rush defense. San Francisco, amazing defensive front. The Rams at the time, I believe, still had Aaron Donald uh, back in week 11. So tough spot there. Um, he faced Pittsburgh. That was after TJ Watt was back. I think that was the game that Micah Fitzpatrick missed with his appendectomy. So partially a uh, better spot. They faced Baltimore. I think that was post Roquan Smith trade. So they've had a lot of tough situations. And Atlanta is not that in terms of like the way a running back can feast against them. So we get them a buy. Maybe Kamara is healthier now than he was before. There's no Mark Ingram. The Saints are still in the a a a NFC South race, despite being whatever, like four and eight. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I was so, like, presumably they've played Atlanta by now. Uh, they they played one. in week one. And he, and he did nothing. Nine carries, 39 yards, yeah. four targets and seven yards. And I'm not saying like copy and paste that. Yeah. You make a really good point, and you actually almost, almost sold me on Kamara as someone I should just play. And I, I still might because running back is what it is this week. Yeah. So they're but four and nine, hesitant. which means they're only two games out in the NFC South. Um, this is a pretty big matchup. These two teams hate each other. Um, so, like, maybe there's that. I think that Kamara is someone I need to give a lot of thought to this week and make sure I'm not dismissive based on the game log. I was not into it before I talked did the devil's advocate like yeah <laughs> argument. I'm like, ah, oh, that kind of actually makes sense. So yeah. I feel like the two guys who I think fit that mold this week of like, I'm pretty turned off, but think I should get to them are now Kamara and Joe Mixon. Um, we'll talk about Mixon in the trend section, but yeah. Kamara, I think I might need to be on this week. Yeah. And, and we're not just here to like read the box scores or anything, but you want to see what the tangible upside Something. has been. He has two games with at least 20 Fanduel points. One of those is 20.4 against Seattle. Yeah. Uh, but he does have a 38.3 point game. Aided um, by three his... touchdowns, but even you take away the 18 points, it's still 20 with no touchdowns. So that's good. Yeah. So you're basically banking on what was the, were the issues related to the matchups or just this offense in general? And I'm not sold that it's not just the offense. So yeah. I, I'll have some Camara. I've decided on that already. I have reversed course from just no Camara to some Camara, but he's not, I'm not itching to play him in my head to head against you, even though I might. Yeah. I will also say that this game has the fourth highest total by my like new total model uh, on the main <laughs> slate. 
Um, it's it's forty five point three four. So uh, you know it's not high. Okay. Uh, but Jim, I I know I, I know you were you were we were talking about that process. It made a lot of sense to me. You Are you out now? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> And for that reason, I'm out. Speaking of that game, yeah, that total is high despite a downward adjustment for Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter starting for the Falcons over Marcus Mariota. Ritter's a third-round pick. Uh, Mariota struggled this year, but he wasn't as awful as people made him seem to be. So I do have a downgrade in there for Ritter and still potentially might like the over despite that. So how does Ritter starting impact your view of, I guess we can just say Drake London, unless you want to talk about uh, Cordero Patterson here? Uh, no, I'm not a CPAT guy. I, I I still respect the the Saints defense enough, especially in New Orleans, that I don't like to to get there. My question to you is: uh, you do a lot of quarterback work. What should we expect from Ritter, and is he viable um, at a sixty five hundred dollars salary? Uh, I don't think the passing. So it's like kind of, like he's weirdly kind of like Mariota in that mm. like he's super super athletic. Like he didn't run a lot in college, but like he's a great athlete. Like he tested super well. Um, I thought he was fun. Uh, he's very experienced. He's not super old. I think that's a really good combination in terms of quarterbacks. My model liked him uh, more than guys like Malik Willis and stuff like that. So, you know, it was he's a third round pick. Expectations for a third round pick should always be minuscule. But they're still in the NFC South. They decided to bench Mariota despite that. I think that is an endorsement of Ritter in, in a sense. So. I'm not super high on this offense. And like I said, I do have a downward adjustment in there for them. And if London's salary weren't 63, it looks like Marshawn Lattimore might play this week. He got an unlimited practice Wednesday. He's been out since week six. So he's been out for a long time. Um, I wouldn't like downgrade London based on that, but it's noteworthy. I think um, I, I think that if I were to tell you like the most simple way to phrase this, I will have a non zero number of Camara London stacks in multi entry. I might get to Camara himself in single entry, but I don't think I'd burn a London lineup in single entry personally. Um, that's where I'm at on it right now. Yeah. I, I don't want to stick on Camara too much, but he was someone when I was looking at loves, I only have two, two running back loves. Cause I figured I'd find a third <laughs> throughout the show. I just, I didn't have, I refused to name a third. I, I, I couldn't, I didn't have three that I liked yeah. that much. I was like, I'll, I'll find someone. It might be him. And in that regard, then I should probably God. be more open to Are we gonna uh, regret this? London. Are we gonna regret this on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon? Camara? Yeah. Yeah, we will. Um okay. we'll have we'll finish with uh eight carries, four targets. Four targets, yeah. Sixty seven total yards. His team will they won't even show up on red zone. They won't even show a single play. Yeah. Um Maybe a Ritter pick six or something, or a Dalton pick six. That might be yeah, more likely. Yeah, like that. Or Taysom uh, Hill just fake handing off to seventy yard Camara. touchdown for Taysom Hill, and then no other yards the entire game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Corey Davis missed practice Wednesday with a concussion. Though Robert Sala said that he's optimistic that Davis will be cleared for Sunday. Davis's injury helped lead to ten targets for Elijah Moore this past week. So, how will Davis's availability impact your view of Moore and Garrett Wilson? You know, just kind of. If more or if Davis plays stuff like that, yeah. If Davis plays, um, I wouldn't get to Elijah Moore. Um, I think Elijah Moore is is viable just due to the salary and the fact mm -hmm. that look, like if we want to play, you know, Patrick Mahomes, um, if we want to play Jalen Hurts, if we want to play Derek Henry, Jamar Chase, I really think I'll make a case for Travis Kelsey, which it's like the easiest thing to do of all time. But the fact that he has not had good games, I don't think he's like at the forefront of people's minds. We're going to need some guys at, at sub 6,000 salaries. So I hope that Davis rests up, gets well, uh, so I can plug in some Elijah Moore. Uh, but if Davis plays, probably not going to play either of them, despite the matchup. And I still can't get out of my head, like, the salary for Garrett Wilson. Yeah. Like, I, I get it with the matchup holistically, but that's really difficult um, to play, like, Garrett Wilson over Keenan Allen. Yeah. Like I'm not saying they're the same salary, but like give me Devontae Smith probably with the savings factored in. Yeah, I think I'm more receptive to Wilson than I thought I'd be. Um, I think he might just be a freak. Um, I'm receptive to him. Yeah, I'm not real. I'm not 
logically thinking I can play a lot of Garrett Wilson this week. Right. From a roster construction perspective, yes, I agree with that. I would also say with Moore and Wilson, their salary on another site that shall not be named is egregious, and people are going to be on them this week. And I, I'm guessing that will translate to FanDuel mm-hmm. as well, especially for, for Moore. But I think that let's say Davis is cleared from concussion protocol and plays. I think that that makes Elijah more like, I don't, I don't like seeking out like, Oh, to fade the chalk. Cause like, that's such a, like an easy fallback. And it's such a, like a, it's a lazy, a lot of times a lazy analysis. Um, I would be actively looking to be underway on Elijah Moore if Corey Davis plays. Cause I think that, that leads oh, yeah. to another, another path to failure and his yard is upside. Even on those 10 targets, I think he had like 60 yards. Like it's like he went nuts. Um, so I don't know. I would like to be underweight. Realistically, he's probably the best option in this 5,000 range. So I might not, I might need to wind up being there, but my goal would be to be underweight. Um, would you use Davis at all or no? Uh, probably not. Um, I don't even know what his salary is, to be honest. He is 57. So right by Elijah Moore. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess maybe it, He'd be a really good pivot off more. No one will use Davis. <laughs> That's true. Where do you rank them compared to Michael Gallup? Probably Gallup first, regardless. Same here. And a uh, similar conundrum at the top. Uh, not that they're all the same salary, but like CD Lamb at 81, Keenan Allen at 8,000, or Garrett Wilson at 78. How do you rank those guys? Um, Factoring in things like how likely you are to stack the games, etc. I think that I would probably go Keenan last just because he has, I think he has the lowest odds to scorch me for like 140 yards. So I go lamb one, Wilson two, Allen three, probably I'm fine with that. I just, I don't dislike Allen and I will use him in game stacks, but I think that's the the key knit I'd pick with him. Yeah. I like CD lamb a lot this week. I do too. Uh, Canarius Tony got in another limited session Wednesday, should return from his hamstring injury this week. Miko Hardman also returned to practice and should be act or could be activated from IR following his abdominal illness. Sounds like he regained the weight that he lost. So it sounds like he's tracking towards playing. We'll talk about the Chiefs in the trend section. On the opposing side, the Texans appear likely to be without Brandon Cooks and Nico Collins this week. We saw Chris Moore pop up in week 15 or week 14. Any interest in Chris Moore now that his salary is six thousand dollars? So I went back and watched all of his targets from last week. Film boy, yeah, uh, just to see because uh, his numbers were were pretty crazy. He had a a forty six percent target share, fifty eight point four receiving yards over expectation, catch rate over expectation of nineteen point seven percentage points. So basically, everything went his way is what that means, but it's kind of like a Rorschach test with him because he came out and got like a screen pass to start ran some jet motion uh, twice. He scored on one of them, uh, you know, inside the five. So like the, the overall eight out of 7.4, not very appealing, um, had a six sideline catch. Uh, so like, is he going to, is he going to maximize his opportunities from bad quarterback play? weekly probably not um is it really worth the upside probably not then again who else are we going to stack from for bring back stacks with with the texans nobody so i think it i think he's basically if i'm assuming that uh, i want mahomes and kelsey to keep a game like somewhat close i'll play chris Moore. otherwise i'll just hope that it's a dud yeah so you said Moore had like 58 expected receiving yards right no yards over expectation so his Um, expected receiving yards was like 50 his expected receiving yards he actually have he had 124 so yeah basically like basically doubled his uh on 11 targets he's expected to get that's because he had a really sick sideline catch yeah um which was uh most likely not very catchable there was another downfield pass that I don't know which of the two quarterbacks it was because I wasn't paying attention. Driscoll went through like six times. um, The the backup tight end. Well, there was some scrambling, so. Yeah. uh, But it was like, not a busted play, I'll say, but like a downfield pass. And the Cowboys lost like multiple cornerbacks, like, or multiple secondary pieces, either in-game or pre-game during warmups. So like, I feel like I'd rather not get to more. Um, 
even like if I have if, if you're playing like Mahomes, like give me or, ten Mahomes lineups, I'll probably put more in like three and have no bring backs in the other seven. I think um, I forgot to put the backfield on the sheet, but um, oh, yeah. Damian Pierce not going to play this week. They also released Eno Benjamin. Tough break for Eno. Everyone gets hurt and he gets released. Yeah. <laughs> like whenever someone's hurt, he's gone. Um, it's very odd, which means that they basically have Rex Burkhead and Daria Gumbawale. I don't want to do that. Um, so can you just give me a reason not to, please? Uh, Daria's salary is 5,000. Rex is 48. Gosh, I think it. I think at a certain point when salaries are that low, yeah, you reconsider what it means to be a good play. Yeah, because you can play Mahomes and Kelsey stacks with yeah pieces of the other offense. Oh boy, are they the are they the plays? So all right, last week Ogunba Wale twenty seven percent snap rate, Rex eight percent. Ogunba Wale, 30% of the routes. Burkhead, 7%. Burkhead, uh, of do you have any getting... lingering Jared Dokes takes from last year's draft? He's on their practice squad. Uh, I do not. Okay. Seventh round pick out of Cincinnati. Um, it's fine. I'd guess he'd be called up. And he's kind of like the bigger guy. So I bet that he probably winds up getting the early down work. And then Ogumba Wale and Rex split like the late down stuff. That'd be my like that. That's me trying to like give myself an out to not use this backfield is saying, oh, Dokes will get the early down stuff and the other guys will get the late down stuff. This team is going to run the ball the, as, yeah. as long as they can, as much as they can. I think, I think I might be on Ogumba Wale. I think of the guys, he'd be the one I'd be highest on just because yeah. I want I want pass catching ability, and he has that. And like you said, he played above Burkhead last week. Now, Burkhead was coming off a concussion, um, but still, he got cleared to play. So, I don't know. I mean, we've seen... Uh, I, we don't want to spend too long on this situation, but it could be a, a key piece. Yeah, um, it could be. As Zimba Wale, as it is. 29, 20, and 27% of the snaps the past three games... Burke had played in the first of those three. So he outperformed Burkhead in week 12. Yeah. Here's his snaps were down. Yeah. I mean, bad. like a Gunba Wale or like Elijah Moore is like a, a Elijah flex Moore. level play to open up the rest of the lineup. I'd use, rather use Elijah Moore by a mile. Yeah. Personally. Uh, the Eagles designated Dallas Goddard to return from IR. He has missed the past four games with a shoulder injury. We'll talk about the Eagles in the bookmaker section. Same game chase. Claypool missed practice Wednesday with a knee injury. Concerning, given that they're coming off a bye. Uh, Matt Eberflus also said that it was either him or Luke Getzey, their OC, said that Claypool doesn't know the playbook yet, which is not ideal. <laughs> He's been there for a bit. Um, that's not ideal. Um, again, we'll talk about them later on. Najee Harris missed practice. With a hip injury on Wednesday, he did lose snaps to Jalen Warren last week. I thought it was kind of odd because Najee looked okay at times during that game. So I thought it was weird that his snap rate was about 60%. Uh, maybe he picked up a hip injury there. Kenny Pickett able to get in a limited session, trying to work back from a concussion. So if Najee sits, we'll play this game again. Where are you on Warren at $5,100? I'd be pretty all in at that yeah. salary. Uh, Warren at 51 or Harris at 65, assuming that Ramondre and Najee sit. Warren. I think so, too. For but I'd like both seller. a lot. Like, Warren would be a core play, I think, for me. Yeah, yeah I think my I think my third running back is going to be either, like, Kamara, um, Damian Harris, or Jalen Warren. Third running back after, like, ETN. And Henry? Henry, yeah. Okay, cool. Those are my two as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of the same interests at the end of the show. Yeah. What could go wrong, though, right? Well, I mean, I punched my microphone. Good look, form. Like the secret is, it's not that hard to find the the two or three best plays of the position. The real angle to all of this is finding the the guys who are not as obvious. Yeah. Uh, Warren, a 40% snap rates <clears throat> this past week, again, with um, Najee playing for the most part. Um, he's had yardage. He's pretty good pass catcher. 
I want all that stuff. He's 51 facing the Panthers. I don't mind Deontay Foreman in that game on the opposing side, but I'd I'd happily dump out of him for Harris or Warren if given the chance to do so. So rest up, Najee. Playing well recently. We want you to stay healthy. See, was actually still a shot at the playoffs. Um, so, you know, there's that. But rest up, Najee. And rest up, Ramondre. We need you. Actually, yeah. The the dynasty team I have Ramondre on is done. So rest up. Take the year off. Uh, we'll come back fresh in 2023. Wow, that's upsetting. Uh, 2023. Okay, let's dive in the bookmaker section for week 15. One of the higher totals with a tight spread is in Jacksonville for our Jags hosting the Cowboys. Our Cowboys? Uh, maybe? Is yeah. this an hour matchup? Love it. Uh, totals 47 and a half with the Cowboys as four and a half point favorites. This game has the highest game-wide projected efficiency by my model. We talked about the Jags salaries Monday. Very forgiving to a disturbing level. So where does this game rank for you in terms of game stacks? Uh, number one. Two quarterback game? I think so. Mm-hmm. I think the real... Maybe like the real question this week isn't how do we get to like Henry and Kelsey and Chase. It's can we trust the lower salaried quarterbacks at all with like yeah. Dak and Lawrence specifically? Yeah. And I think we I think we can feel pretty good about that. Uh-huh. Um but Dak is one of my loves this week. So yeah, I think it's two quarterback game. I think it is is as well. I would say the DAC is above Lawrence for me, despite mm-hmm. Lawrence having a really good game last week. Didn't run a lot in that game, which is concerning given the toe injury. He missed practice again Wednesday. He'll play, but like it's, you know, he's not fully healthy. Uh, but I prefer DAC. Obviously, DAC has not had like a pop game yet, but they've been leading by a ton. Stuff like that has been in play a lot. There have been a lot of weird circumstances leading to the lack of pop games for DAC. And I think he has that within his range of outcomes. So, Prefer Dak will likely use Lawrence if I had to guess uh, as of Thursday morning, but I wouldn't be shocked if he gets squeezed out of my player pool. Um, so I'll be here for sure. Let's talk about the pieces within this game. We've got the Cowboys side first. Um, Tony Pollard's salary is high at 82. I still think he's in play for game stacks. Won't get there outside of game stacks, but I think he's in play at 82. Um, you got CeeDee Lamb. You've got uh, Michael Gow. Dalton Schultz's salary is 65. I was pretty off that initially, but like he does, he does have a lot of, a lot of usage uh, since Noah Brown came back. So I don't think I'm off, actively off anybody here. Probably lowest on Schultz relative to salary. Uh, but what's your read on the Cowboys side first? Uh, favorite play is CD Lamb. Uh, well, I guess maybe favorite play is Michael Gallup just because of the salary that he can save us. But um, I really like CD Lamb. He's one of my loves this week. Um, he still has like substantial upside he's not in like the jamar chase tier but in two of his past five he's gone over 100 yards one of those was 150 and two touchdowns um you know the volume's been a bit a bit down but they've been you know they played the colts and that game wasn't competitive and then they had the weird like letdown spot maybe they were looking ahead to other games against the texans i don't know um but you know it's been a minute uh, since we've seen a huge game from Lamb, he has that in his, in his range of outcomes, and so I think that people, it's weird because we, if I just looked at this box score and like knew that it was a good receiver with good market share numbers, I'd be like, okay, people won't really be here, but people do love to play CD Lamb. So I don't know if we'll get a huge discount, but within game stacks, he is a he's a big priority. I don't want to get like a lot of uh, Lamb ETN stacks. Yeah. Throughout. Uh, with Gallup, you touched on him. I just want to expand on him quickly because I agree with everything he said on, on Lamb. With Gallup in the games, since Noah Brown came back, 19% overall target share, 27% deep, 19% inside the red zone. For a receiver at 57 on a slate where we need value, that's fine. Um, so I like Gallup quite a bit. And I would say is my favorite receiver below $6,000? Question mark? Yes. Yeah. I think so. Um, and I feel fine about that. Like, it's not a huge, like, uh, is it, it's not as bad as it felt like DJ Chark two weeks ago. I feel better about Gallup than I did there. I don't think it's as thin of an option, despite the fact he hasn't shown yardage upside yet. I think that he has a building blocks for it within his usage. Looking at the opposing side here, you mentioned Travis Etienne. I think he is a staple for me on this slate. Uh, Etienne has been bad, objectively bad the past couple weeks. And that could be due to the foot injury. And I think that's worth considering, but even when you include those games, 
over his six games as the full featured back for the Jags, 23.2 adjusted opportunities per game, carries plus two X targets, uh, 96.3 yards per game. Very good number for a back at $7,000 and a 43% red zone share in that time. So I want to be heavily on an ETN. I think that he is the most logical bring back for this Jags team. He doesn't get as much passing game work as you'd hope. And I don't think we should expect that to change. Uh, but I see no reasons to push back on him. Any other thoughts on ETN? Nope. Love him. He's one of my loves this week. He's one of the two firm loves that I have uh, running back this week. So Jags pass catchers, Christian Kirk and Zay Jones. Uh, in the 11 games with Marvin Zay Jones active, they're both in a 23% target share, Christian Kirk and Zay Jones. Uh, their deep target share is very similar. The red zone target share is very similar. Zay's salary is 63. I feel like I'll wind up having a lot of lineups with ETN and Zay both in them. Uh, I don't mind having a receiver and a running back from the same team because like it shows up pretty often in perfect lineups. So it's fine. It's not, it's a deterrent upside, but not to the extent where you need to avoid it, especially if they're both under salary, which I think is true here in that same sample, Evan Ingram at 17% target share, 12% deep, 13% red zone. He went off last week, but I'm not expecting that again. I think that I'd like to be off him this week if I can. Uh, what's your read on the pass catchers here? Yeah, pretty similar uh, to you. I think the fact that Zay's salary is substantially lower than Christian Kirk's, but their workloads are similar, yeah. um, makes it pretty easy. That being said, it is, it's also then just as easy to overlook Christian Kirk. Exactly. Um, so both are viable. Um I should probably have Zay as like a consideration for loves at that salary. For sure. Um, not, I'm not saying I didn't consider him, but I don't have him have him in there, but I might even pivot to him throughout the show. Uh, just a really good, good game environment overall. This game could have uh, plenty of points or, you know, frankly, these are two teams that can disappoint. They're sure. not, they're not flawless, but yeah. um, for the salaries here, I think that's the overall takeaway. It's like the salaries are good. And, you know, if I am playing Zay, that's whenever I would feel comfortable maybe overspending a bit to get to Tony Pollard. Is Zay your favorite play in the 6,000 range? Cause he is for me. Uh, let me see who else is there. Cause it's not a great, it's a lot of dudes with bad quarterbacks. He... <laughs> the name I was looking at when you said Mike Evans. Mike Evans. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean Tom Brady. I'm not going to do that. Anymore. Although I do love, I do love Chris Godwin uh, this week. I do not. Good for you. <laughs> you can have him. I'll talk you into him. No, you uh, yeah, Zay's my favorite play in this range. I agree. Uh, okay. Pollard will be close. in your game stacks, correct? Yes, yeah, like Zay Pollard's going to be pretty common for me. Okay, cool. Other tight spread uh, with a high total is in Los Angeles for the Titans and the Chargers. That is up to 47 and a half right now with the Chargers favored by three. It's a good matchup for both sides, too, because the Chargers can't run, but who cares? The Titans stop the run well, uh, so they are going to throw a lot. The Chargers can't stop the run. Huh, they're facing Derrick Henry. Not great. So I feel like this one, the puzzle pieces fit really well, and I don't want to put, I don't want to overthink it. I feel like I should just take the, the good puzzle pieces and go with it, uh, like with a Derrick Henry, Mike Williams stack. Where are you on this game? Very similar. Um in my placeholder lineup right now, I have Henry and Mike Williams together. That's going to be a combo that I have a good amount of, or a good, at least a good amount of confidence in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I talk about like games being a little bit too narrow to stack, which is a good because production we, means we're expecting the production to come through only like so many guys, but it doesn't leave, leave me a whole room, a whole lot of room to like differentiate. So I don't, I don't always love that. And that's just, me being my being spoiled there um but i think the name that i might end up overlooking because like for the for the titans we have derrick henry and we have chiga conquo i think that's basically it yeah <laughs> um for the chargers it's going to be herbert uh keenan mike williams and the name that i think i could end up overlooking is austin eckler which is nothing new for anyone who listens sure so what are your thoughts on like eckler in this spot tough rushing matchup we don't care about rushing for him yeah. um like he's not like my issue with Eckler is always yardage um in the 13 games he's played this year 96.7 yards per game it's a pretty bad number for a guy above 8,000 his red zone rule is amazing though this game could feature a lot of points if I tell you right now that Austin Eckler scores three touchdowns you're not surprised like you're like okay nope. makes sense um, if you tell me he doesn't score and has like 95 yards on 
10 targets, I'm not surprised either. Exactly. Yeah. So I feel like we need to actively wedge Eckler into game stacks because if he goes off, the game probably goes off, right? Yeah. But is he like the the same but different version of Nick Chubb? I guess not Nick Chubb this year, but like... Nope. It's like polar opposite. I think he's like old Derrick Henry. Like Derrick Henry before he got passing game work. Where it's like... He's not going to project super well, but you know he has a path to going bananas. So yeah. what we did with Henry back in the day, again, before he got passing game usage, was we'd ask, what are the odds he burns us for not using him? So for Eckler, what are the odds he gets you two touchdowns? I can get that from FanDuel Sportsbook after accounting for juice. Um, like, I feel like the odds he burns, like gets two touchdowns and burns me for not using him, probably 10 to 15%, which means game stacks only, right? Yeah, game stacks only for sure. Um, and is your is is your favorite game stack here, Henry and Mike Williams? Yeah, I know that'll be popular, but like it should be. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I know. So last week you look at Mike Williams, only six targets in that game, but he was being shadowed by your hat, Xavier Howard, wearing a Dolphins hat right now. Um, <laughs> Xavier, like we don't care about your, like cornerback matchups, but like it can reduce your target share. So he was great in terms of production for that game. Now facing Tennessee, whose weak spot is our cornerback play. I know the like target share was not good for Mike Williams, but I want to be there pretty heavily this week. Where are you on him? And then Keenan love Mike Williams. I like Keenan a lot too. Um, would rather play Keenan in a head to head, but I, I don't know if I'm going to prioritize Keenan over CD lamb this week. Yeah. It is a hundred dollar difference. I'm not saying it's the exact same, but I'm going to go Mike Williams in tournaments time and time again. Uh, yeah. Hit a catch rate over expectation of 40 points last week because just caught everything. Um, He's that's, a grown man. It's absurd. Uh, but yeah, I, I like both. Again, it's just basically only, what, five or six options here, which mm-hmm. is, is totally fine. Yeah. Um, Will you get to Herbert, 83? Yes. I likely will. You won't. You no, I likely will. Um, I, I figured out the reason that he bugs me. It's like, he's like, if you if you took Jimmy Garoppolo, or if you took like a freakazoid and put him in a Jimmy Garoppolo offense where the ADOT is super low, and it's like, why are we doing this? I, I mean, he's got over 330 yards passing on, yes, huge volume, but guess what? This team just is just dropping back and throwing it time and time again. If he and had, if he that's had the thought four, process behind why I will get there. But like, I talked to, I said the same thing on Monday for the And I said that I'd probably use him, but I said that, that, that I'm annoyed with it. <clears throat> that I get, but you know, give him 330 yards, three touchdowns instead of one, and like a 20 yard rushing game. Yeah, none of those would surprise us. No. None of those individual outcomes. And his surprise. salary is very forgiving at eighty three. Yeah, that's a big pitch in his favor too. Uh, easy to stack this game. So I'm going to get there, but like I'm still, I just wish they'd run any other offense than what they do. It's the worst. They're the worst. He's the best. Um, I wish. I just want to see him thrive. Um, like, uh, oh man, um, <laughs> we're gonna say some reckless stuff here so todd monken i don't know if you remember him um he was an offensive coordinator in the nfl a couple years ago he's now georgia's oc if you put todd monken on the chargers as their oc next year with sean payton as the coach i lose my lose my mind out of like just going all in on justin herbert we're not there yet so i want it Todd Malkin, come back. Come back, baby. Come back to the NFL. Okay, this total is a bit more one-sided, but we do have a high total in Chicago for the Bears and Eagles. That is at 48 and a half with the Eagles favored by nine. The Bears are coming off their bye, so Justin Fields should be healthier. Missed practice Wednesday due to an illness, but it sounds like he'll be good to go. We don't know what he'll do in terms of running in a game that doesn't matter to them in theory. The Eagles sound like they'll get Dallas Goddard back. So when you go Eagles, will you bring it back with Bears here? Go Birds. Um, I mean, how many games have really mattered for the Bears lately? If we're being honest. You mean lately isn't like this year total? Zero? Yeah. Like, yeah. So 
I mean, I'm surprised that they even brought him back to begin with with yeah. the shoulder. Because, I mean, there were reports that he's going to be fine. The coach said for... he could be done for the year. <laughs> yeah, like, hey, he's either going to be good to go next week or he's done for the year. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll wait and see. We'll see um, if we're going to amputate the arm. You know, it's 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 up in the air right now. Yes, yeah, so he's got, what, six straight games with a touchdown, seven rushing touchdowns in those six games. Um, a, a season low, six rush attempts for the 71 yards. That's the that's the weird sticking point because he had that long – rush right uh, like for a, 60, a touchdown 50 yard or something like that yeah so like you take that out it's again you know take away everyone's best play it is what it yeah. is but like that's a very different justin fields than what we've been getting now i will say uh season high passing yardage output as well 254 yards no passing touchdowns and, and despite the fact that he's not a high volume passer you know he's had you know uh before that two four six seven straight games with at least one passing touchdown so like that's not super common it's not like he doesn't throw any nothing. passing touchdowns it's not nothing yeah um i don't think he's the best play this week at, with the salary down i don't expect him to rush as much if he does kudos to everyone who foresaw it and, and can look back and say that i was being stupid and he's going to run 13 or 18 times again but I don't think he's going to be a priority for me. And therefore I'm kind of lower on this game as a whole. Yeah. I think that if Claypool can't go, I know that Claypool is not like good, um, <laughs> has not been a difference base for this team, but that means he without both Darnell Mooney and Claypool. And at some point that has to matter. Um, so I think that would hurt me in terms of him too. So if there's no Claypool, I can see myself excluding him. I think he's a sharp play this week in terms of like, Oh, he, people probably won't be on him and his salaries come down. But if there's no Claypool, I think I could see myself not being there. The one guy I do like on the Bears is Cole Komet, $5,300. Uh, he's shown yardage juice this year. It seems like he just kind of figured stuff out. Seven targets in the one game without Darnell Mooney, and now Claypool is banged up too. Uh, 72 yards there. He's now had 70 yards twice in the past four games. So I think Komet works at 53. He'd be the one bring back. But like again, if we do the exercise of if I have – 10 Hertz lineups. I'm probably bringing it back with Komet in four of those. So I like him better than Chris Moore. Four or five, um, I think is where I'd wind up settling in there. Yeah, that that's fair. Um, I almost view this more as like, <laughs> I like Devontae Smith again. And so I'll, I'll do mini stacks there. So I'll probably have a good amount of Cole Komet, whether it's with Hertz or just Devontae. I mean, I like AJ Brown too, obviously, but yeah. Uh, the games I played with Goddard, if we assume he's back, A.J. Brown at 30% target share with 46% of the deep work and 36% in the red zone. Gross. Devontae Smith's target share does come down to 24%, but 24% for a guy at 72 is still pretty good. Um, yeah. Deep work, 22% there, but like we saw him get a lot of deep shots without Goddard. I don't think that'll go away. Uh, Goddard in those games, 21% target share, 26% in the red zone. So I adore Goddard. Um, yeah. People probably won't be there. First game off IR. Maybe they ease him back in, but like I doubt it because he's been talking about being back for the first game for a while. So I think Goddard's actually my favorite piece in the Eagles outside of Hurts. Um, yep. I like it more than Devontae, but I yeah, think all three are very good. Yeah, it's a it's a really easy uh, stack to like. So come that works, um, you know, for – for a lot of reasons, I, I'm going to see Justin Fields play like Justin Fields again, but mm -hmm. I'm okay taking a wait and see approach. I'm not saying I won't have any if I'm playing like yeah. 20 lineups. I'll make sure I have some just because he could put a flamethrower to everything if I don't use him. Right. Um, but it's more of a, a, a FOMO thing than I think he's going to come out and run 18 times yeah. for 170 yards and nine touchdowns. Yeah. Uh, got a question from Jack over on YouTube asking Devonte Smith or Keenan Allen this week. And I want to spin this a little bit differently. So sorry, Jack, I'm not answering your question directly, but we've got three receivers in the 7,000 range. Who we've talked about liking a lot. Devonte Smith, Mike Williams, Christian Kirk, all at 72 or 71 rank them because we like all these games, but rank them for me. Those three. I like, I like Chris Godwin too, but, um, I'm for those, not putting him in there for those three specifically, uh, big Mike, Devonte and Kirk in that order. Probably same. I could see myself talking myself into Kirk over Devonte, but I don't think I'll put anyone above Mike Williams for this week. And you okay. did, and you did rank Keenan versus Lamb and Garrett Wilson and put Keenan last, correct? Uh huh. Okay. 
Correct. Okay, let's go to the trend section here and talk about our Lions. How many teams do we own here? I, I guess, I don't know. Um, I'm going to say our Lions because they're the best. Um, you're talking about them against good defenses on the road. I'm curious what sample you pulled because it's not a big one. Um, it's good defenses and it's on the road. Oh, okay. Talk me through that then. I didn't read your trend, clearly. Um, yeah. What did you see when you looked at the data? I didn't, I didn't read it either. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're on the road. Uh, they were, you know, they've been darlings for us for a bit now. Um, Jared Goff, QB four in consecutive weeks in, in season long. Love to see that. Uh, but they're up against the Jets, who are fourth in adjusted pass defense, ninth in adjusted rush defense, according uh, to number fires metrics. Um, so, you know, what do we do with them for this week? Uh, Jared Goff at home. There's a Jared Goff at home narrative. Uh, has averaged 21.1 FanDuel points per game, 51% passing success rate, 0.31 passing net expected points per drop back, which is 0.25 over expectation with the defense's expectations. So that's really good. Uh, 277 yards per game, two and a half touchdowns per game on the road. Fandle points are cut in half in, in just five games. This team has not played a lot of road games. Um, that comes with a passing net expected points per drop back over expectation of 0. 0.01. So basically playing to the level of the opponent, still a decent success rate of almost 49%. Um, 227 yards per game, 0.4 passing touchdowns per game. Um, against top-tier pass defenses on the road, there's just two games against the Patriots and the Cowboys. Uh, the caveat there is that Amon Ross St. Brown barely played in those. And so like, there's really no sample, that Jim, like as Jim alluded to, to know what we're going to get. And that can be bad because we don't know what to expect, but it can also be good if people just assume that anytime Goff's on the road, or against a tough defense, he doesn't play well. Amon Ross St. Brown is very good at football, so I think that's something that we need to account for. Um, Goff, about just under 230 yards uh, in those games. Horrible efficiency. Took a lot of sacks in those games. Um, and the Lions scored six total points in those matchups. So I don't think people are clamoring to play the Lions. If anything, they're excited to play the Jets against the Lions, which I understand. But if you're excited to play the Jets, if we still like Garrett Wilson, despite the salary, we want some Elijah Moore, we're considering Corey Davis. Maybe Zonovan Knight is like an answer in game stacks um, at 7,200. Then we should take a look at the other side and see, you know, what is, is actually here. But again, very difficult situation for Jerry Goff in those spots. Um, and on the road against the other three teams who are all 24th or worse in adjusted pass defense, 0.22 uh, passing that expected points. Per drop back over expectation. Again, that accounts for opponents. So he's been very good on the road otherwise. Um, just a 226 yards and 0.7 touchdowns, but the efficiency was there. Volume and touchdown luck, not quite. So it, it's sort of a do you think that Goff can do something with St. Brown against the tougher defense? Or do you think that anytime he's on the road against a tough defense, no matter who he has, he's going to crumble? And that's an, a question we have to answer this week. Um, I'm not going to get to Goff himself. Uh, but it's more about the the viability of someone like an Amon Ross St. Brown in a tough matchup. Maybe DJ Chark. Um, unfortunately for us, no DeAndre Swift. But since week 13 with Josh Reynolds back to a bigger workload, uh, St. Brown, 28.4% target share, which is 10.5 per game, 91 yards per game, and a touchdown per contest. 57% red zone target share. Absolutely love to see that. I could understand that St. Brown is not anyone's priority, but could make a lot of sense in, in the right uh, types of lineups. DJ Chark, 18% target share, six and a half per game, 4.0 downfield targets per game, eight out of 14 yards. Love that. Uh, DeAndre Swift, Josh Reynolds, each with a 13 and a half percent target share. Uh, Reynolds, 9.6 start, eight out, one and a half downfield targets per game. I'm not going to get there, but, you know, again, like we have the, the Jets are sal- uh, like priced up to roster the lions kind of untested in this regard, but we know that they're a good offense generally. So like we talked about the jets enough. Do you like the lions at all here? So I think that like the, if I want to like, I love Jared Goff, as people right. know. I've profited off the lines recently. So, like, if I want to remove that bias out of the situation, I think that what I want to do is go back to last week and think about my thoughts on the Bills. Bills are better offense than the Lions. I didn't have a lot of interest in the Bills at home against the Jets because I respect this defense so much. Yeah. So, why would I be high in the Lions against the Jets? That's, again, like, I think 
you're asking the right questions. I'm just asking myself, like, if I flip it that way, I don't think I'd have any interest. So, like, Amon Ra's fine at whatever his salary is, but I'm not going to prioritize him over even A.J. Brown or mm-hmm. C.D. Lamb. Probably, so, probably going to be lower there. I adore DJ Chark, as you know, but I don't want to use outside receivers against uh, Sauce Gardner and um, DJ Reed. Like, they're both very good. So as high as I was on Shark the past two weeks, I'm okay jumping off board this week. I'll get back on. Um, and it's not about Goss home road splits. And you, you were talking about this too. Like, you know, you were f- accounting for the fact that, hey, people are probably overreacting. Um, I think they are too. This is just about the Jets defense. Yeah. And I don't want to go against them. So I think we're on the same page with this team for the same reason, which, ma- which makes me feel better about it too. Yeah, like the trends are they're not based on like, here, let me talk you into everyone that I like. Right, it's right. what's here. What's what are we, we maybe not seeing initially what needs to a little bit more uh, focus. And I think, I do think pretty sure that the lions play a lot of road games to finish out their season. Cause they, only yeah, have they haven't played so a, far. a road game in like a month. <laughs> so I think that like, if golf gets good, I don't know who they play in those, but if there are some good matchups there, yeah, I'll be in. Maybe, maybe we hope that they struggle this week. Yeah. I want them to be like, off. not bad enough where it actually gives me worry. <laughs> Um, but like bad enough where it throws people off the scent. Like they get the Panthers next week. Next week, they get the they Bears. The, that's at home. And Packers the Pack- on the road. If, yeah, potentially to make the playoffs. Hopefully to make the playoffs. Um, yeah, I I won't be here this week. I kind of hope we get a chance to buy in later on, though. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be fun to me. Okay, let's talk about my trend here, which is the Chiefs while they are leading, because as we saw last week, the Cowboys, you know, uh, being heavily favored doesn't mean you'll be leading the entire way. But the Chiefs are 14 point favorites this week. So it's worthwhile to dig in to see what they do when they are up. The Chiefs have run 143 plays while leading by eight or more points in the second half this year. The league average pass rate in those scenarios is 39.7%. The Chiefs are at 46%, which ranks eighth among teams with at least uh, 20 such plays. So they're more pass-heavy than league average, but they will pedal back at least a bit. The Chiefs have won five games this year by double digits. In those five games, Mahomes is at 37.4 pass attempts per game. That's down from 39.3 for the full season, but still a respectable number. Mahomes is at 27.74 FanDuel points per game in that sample. He has topped 32 twice. He had a rough game against the Rams to drag that down where they couldn't do anything in the red zone. But across all games, Mahomes' FanDuel point average is 25.5. So it actually has gone up in blowouts, and he has upside. So I want to get a read on Mahomes' projected popularity. If people are off him, this would be a great spot to pivot. I think that'll happen uh, based on the implied total, based on the defense, stuff like that. But if he were low roster, he'd be pretty sick. I also think there is enough passing volume to get to the pass catchers. The problem is that Kadarius Tony is back. Miko Hardman likely back. Not an issue for Travis Kelsey. He can be fine despite those guys, but it does cloud things a bit for Juju Smith-Schuster, who seemed odd the past couple of weeks. Uh, he did do well last week, but a bit odd. The one game they played with Tony and Hardman, Juju had 12 targets and Kelsey had 17, but that was on 62 targeted throws. Can probably cut that in, like, not half, but, like, almost half for this week. So... You can take swipes at Harbin at 55 or Tony at 6,000, but I think Kelsey may be the only desirable stack partner with Juju being like an other to consider here. As far as the backfield goes, Zay Pacheco's salary is 76, which is pretty high. He's averaging 90 yards in scrimmage per game and five without CEH, which is fine, but his 30% red zone share is lower than you'd like for his salary. Jared McKinnon's salary is more forgiven at 62, but he doesn't really get rushing attempts, and this would be the script to get rushing attempts. Even after this huge game, McKinnon is at 60 yards from scrimmage per game and five without CEH. So I like Mahomes and Kelsey a lot, but their salaries are high. Open to Pacheco, but he is also imperfect. So it's tough. I want to be on the Chiefs, but it's not easy to get yourself there. So how are you viewing this team against the Texans? Um, Love them as a pivot. Um... And not just in the sense of like I need to see Mahomes at a certain, yeah, uh, like he's gonna be he's gonna be lower roster than he deserves to be, just Probably because correct. of the the spread, yeah. um, and because Houston like did some things last week, but he is he's a few weeks removed from like reminding us that he's Patrick Mahomes, and I don't really think that that's uh, 
gone by any means. Like played Denver last week, threw for 350. Uh played Cincinnati. That was a weird game. Like Cincinnati really had the right game plan to like yeah. limit them. He had just 27 pass attempts in that in that matchup. Um played the Rams before that. But if you if you keep going back, like it's been there. So I'm not that concerned. Again, I think that Kelsey is bound for a huge game this week. And I feel really good about that. He's one of my loves. I'll, I'll talk about him in more detail in a bit, but uh, I am okay saying I like this offense, even if it's just Mahomes and Kelsey. I mean, yeah, I think that's fair. Where are you in Pacheco? I wouldn't ask. Uh, because of this way the running back works, I'm okay with it. I just, I don't fear Pacheco that much because I don't, I just don't like, I'm not saying he doesn't get any red zone work, but I just assume that uh, Jerick McKinnon's going to come on in the red zone. And I don't yeah. love that for well, his red zone share is 30%, salary. which is not nothing. It's not right. Uh, it's, but it's not good. Is it salary. good at 76? No, it's not. Right. But when you account for the fact that they're projected to score 90 points, that helps. So. It does. So. Yeah. He's had I, 10 I points. That, I, would, I would consider a Mahomes Pacheco stack to try to get all of the yeah. production that they have. Um, if you just look at his, his point totals with no touchdowns the past four, it's 10.7, 9.1, 9.2, 10.8. That's, that's like... If he gets you two, which is possible here, like that's doable. Uh, it's also still like 22 points, which is not great either. So, but the the rushing yardage could increase too. So I feel like, again, I, I don't want to say this for like everybody, but like he's a 20, 15, 20% kind of play. Um, but I think that's that's what he deserves. I'd prefer Camara over Pacheco though. Yeah, it's a very scary week. Uh, very easy to say. I'm going to have some of, some of this guy, some of that guy. Yeah, it's tough. It's not fun. Okay, let's go to your second trend. Talk about the Raiders because they're facing the Patriots. Very good defense. What do you see when the Raiders are put up against a tough foe? Yeah, I mean, there are just not a lot of situations that are flawless this week. And so you want to look a little bit deeper and make sure that we're not crossing off teams that maybe don't have to be crossed off. Uh, This week, they host the Patriots. And again, with a solid total for for this slate, tight spread as well, but New England... Second in adjusted pass defense, according to number fires metrics. The Raiders have faced just one top 10 adjusted pass defense and two in the top 12. Against those pass defenses, though, uh, Derek Carr has four games because those are against in-division uh, opponents with the Chargers and the Broncos. Um, in those games, Derek Carr has averaged 260 yards and 1.5 touchdowns, playing just above uh, opponent expectation in those matchups. Uh, 260 and a touchdown or two is not terrible. It's not enough for me to want to play Derek Carr in a bad spot, but it's more about can they move the ball? Can they be relevant? And can they make uh, their skill position players relevant as well, especially with, you know, p- potentially, assumingly so, Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro back. But um, in those four games, Devontae Adams just forced the ball. Uh, 13.8 targets, 140 yards, 1.3 touchdowns, 43% of the targets, um, 3.89 yards per route run. Like, I'm 57% red zone targets here. I'm not very concerned about Devontae, and I don't think people want to play him, especially coming off of a down game. Like, it's a super sick workload. Um, and again, he's coming off of a bad game on Thursday. Devontae now has three or fewer catches in four games, including last week on that Thursday, uh, Baker Fest. Um, in the three follow-up games, Devontae has averaged 12 targets, 92.3 yards, and a touchdown with a 35% target share compared to 18% for those the weeks before when he didn't have a lot of catches. So seems like they really try to get that uh, correction in there. Now, I know Darren Waller, Hunter Renfro potentially coming back, but I don't think that really affects Devontae Adams too much. Um, and the only two games with them, playing at least 50% of the snaps. Those were way back the first two weeks of the season. Devontae, 32% target share. Renfro, 22%. Waller, 19%. Matt Collins, 12%. I honestly think Devontae's a really fun pivot play that people will not use. I won't I won't argue with anyone who doesn't want to get there because of the matchup, but he's been really good against the only tough defenses he's faced. And 
there's the narrative that he should just get peppered. Um, I think that's fun. And if you give me Waller and Renfro to take away some extra attention, I like that. Uh, Josh Jacobs, if he plays totally into it, just because the workload is sick. <clears throat> um, do you see enough here that you would consider Devonte? I know we talked about Waller a little bit, but like, where are you with this team against a really tough opponent? So you mentioned the overall target share for Devonte. Do you know his deep target share and red zone share in those games? Two? I do not. 50% deep target share and 42% in the red zone bananas. Just that's like, sick. and that's with those guys in there. Yeah. Um, it's sick. So I should be on Devonte. His salary is actually very fair at 85. Um, yeah. and no one's going to use him. Yeah. If we get Damian Harris there too, a Damian Harris Devonte game stack isn't bad. My numbers do like the under in this game, uh, it has it at 41, uh, point three points. So pretty bad game overall, but, I don't think using Devonte is off base. They played a lot of bad games, like from a they mm-hmm. haven't played in, their defense stinks, but like you know, so it's, you know. I think I should be there. I'm not sure if I will be, but I think like I think it's a should versus will. I right. should, not sure if I will. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it does because I think he's a I think he's a really fun pivot play, but I don't even know if I'll talk myself into it. I hope I've I already, do. I've talked yeah. myself into the process behind it, but yeah, yeah. I think the, so. I was talking before about um, what game stack. Oh, I was saying like I'll probably have a non-zero number of Camara London game stacks. I should probably try to make sure if we get no Ramondre that I have a non-zero number of Damian Harris Devonte Adams game stacks. I think that's very in play. Yep. Let's finish up with my second trend here and talk about Tampa Bay defense because one of the more reliable offenses on the slate is the Bengals. The problem is that they're facing the Bucks and that offense the the bucks offense is not creating shootouts right now and the defense is largely good so i wanted to see if they were good enough to make us avoid the bengals the bucks currently 7th in my defensive power rankings they're specifically good against the rush they are in the 77th percentile there in early downs they're in the 67th percentile against the pass in early downs They've been especially good against the rush when Akeem Hicks has been healthy because they've exceeded expectations against the rush on early downs in five out of seven games when Hicks has played versus just three out of six when he has sat. For this week, Hicks will play, but Vita Vea sounds like he's probably going to sit. And I think that opens stuff up for Joe Mixon, uh, whose salary got bumped down to 81. He had bad uses last week, but I think that's intriguing. You can hurt the Bucs through the air, especially as injuries have piled up. Uh, both the Saints and 49ers shredded them the past two weeks with Antoine Winfield out. Um, he also missed weeks eight and nine, and they weren't as bad there, but they did perform below expectations. Uh, Winfield did not practice at all last week, so not sure what his status will be heading into this game. As far as Wednesday goes, he got in a limited session, so he may be back, but the Vita Vea loss might potentially nullify that a bit the Bengals haven't played many good defenses since they completely revamped their offense back in week five the one defense I'd classify as good as the Steelers who don't grade out well for the full season but uh did a both TJ Watt and Minka Fitzpatrick in that game and the Bengals hung 37 on them uh Burrow went for 355 and four touchdowns even without Jamar Chase so I think Burrow even if Boyd and Higgins are both out can still light it up here he's at least on my radar and it helps me feel better about Jamar Chase at 9,000. Trenton Irwin ran 33 routes on Sunday with Higgins and Boyd both going down early. He had just two targets, uh, but had 58 yards. Eight out was 21.1. One of those was on a broken play, uh, which is worth noting. But still, Irwin is at 1.2 yards per route run this year. Has a target on just 11% of those routes. But if there's less competition, I think he's pretty interesting as a lower salary play this week. So... Wishy-washy, but I think I kind of want to get to Mixon. I think Chase and Burrow and Irwin all have some appeal. How are you feeling about the Bengals this week? Yeah, I like them. Uh, Burrow's very capable, um, despite the fact that he's without. Uh, you know, Look, I think Tyler Boyd's okay. T. Higgins is f- fantastic, mm-hmm. but he still has Jamar Chase. So like, this is one of those spots where yeah, you downgrade the offense, but this is still an offense that we would like if it was a different team and they never had T Higgins, we'd be like, yeah, let's play. I mean, I don't know if this makes sense, but like the Vikings, like we still like Justin Jefferson. We don't, I guess we don't like Kirk cousins, but you know, there there are examples out there of like just one great receiver, a good running back, 
that we're still into the offense. So I'm not going to downgrade them that much. I probably will play Trent Irwin. Um, I think I'm going to load up on some value receivers this week just because I, I thought you'd yell to. me for that. I'm pretty happy about that. I thought you'd be mad at me. Man, I live in the in the. No offense to anyone. I was in born that. in the dumpster. Yeah, I was going to say no offense to anyone in the NFL, but I live in the trash tier, and um, I'm okay taking chances on guys. Uh, so yeah, Irwin, I'll play him. I liked Mixon last week. I'm here, and I I think Chris Godwin's a good bring back. I don't. Um, I'm not as high on that. Um, <laughs> But I do like Irwin enough if we get no Higgins and Boyd. Now, the Higgins situation is well, what it is. Like, yeah. is there a scenario in which you'd use Higgins this week? No. Not even if he's full and off the injury report on Friday? Because he was limited and off the injury report last Friday. Uh, if he's full and off, I'll do it again, and I'll hate myself for it. But, like, he's 75. So if he's full yeah, and off the injury I, I report, will. I'll do it. I, yeah. I, I, I'll do it, yeah. It just feels... I'm still hurt by that. I'm so mad at Zach Taylor. He's the worst. He's not getting a Christmas card this year. Not yeah, he also said that Joe Mixon was the starter, and yeah, he, he like started. The guy this week. He lie. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most truthful he was all week. Um, do you agree with me on Mixon or no? What, or what am there? I agreeing with? I think he's a good tourney play, and to the point where I'd use him in single entry. Um probably a little bit lower than that but he's sure. like i prefer him to like miles sanders yeah i do too pollard um, or mixon uh probably mixon but i'd say pollard because i'm more likely to stack it's true that game but it's fair i think mixon will be like that guy like he'll be on five percent of rosters and if you use him he goes nuts it could be like easy slate yeah. Um, I think the I think the Pollard Mixon thing is exactly what I was talking about at the top of the show, where it's it's going to dict like my exposure level is going to dictate on which games I actually end up stacking. Yeah, if I can talk myself into more of like the Bucks and I just like load up on that game a little bit more than I thought, sure. then I'll have more Mixon than Pollard. But I think that's kind of ultimately what it's going to come down to. Yeah. So Mixon, not like a cash game consideration for me, but. A really good tournament play, I think, and one I want to actively seek out because bad workload last week, but still had 106 yards. Uh, workload could expand this week. We don't know. No Vita Vea, but people probably won't know slash account for that because they don't really care about defensive players. So I think that's uh, a fun angle to play. Yeah, this is why we're. I'm. I will talk defensive stuff, and you talk me out of bad plays. You and know? yeah, you talk offensive line and defense. And then you talk me out of bad plays, but apparently not Trent Irwin, which is concerning. I thought you might, but you didn't. So, nah, man, I need I need some savings. Good hair for Trent Irwin. Yeah. You should consider washing it, but it's it's decent hair. Okay, weather for this week. Uh, we do have ten mile per hour winds for that game between the Bengals and the Bucks. Nothing concerning yet, but worth noting. Same thing for Jets and Lions, 10 miles per hour there. And then 12 mile per hour winds for Eagles and Bears, which is like high enough where like it's worth a bit of a downgrade, but uh that's actually the highest total in my model for this week is that game. So I wouldn't downgrade Hertz too much, despite the wind being up there. Let's go now position by position, break down our favorite plays on FanDuel for week number 15. Brandon, what are you doing at quarterback this week? Uh, I want to get to Patrick Mahomes. I guess the caveat here should be a lot of my loves are going to be higher salary guys. Cause we're going to find some value by Sunday. We just don't know exactly where it is yet. Like between potentially running backs, um, like Trent Irwin, depending on you know T Higgins stuff like that, but um, I think we can spend up to be contrarian this week. And again, like being contrarian at quarterback is not something you have to worry about too much, if at all. But if you can do it, and it works out that Mahomes is a little bit overlooked, I'll take it. There really aren't like value quarterbacks in elite matchups, which is something I think I need to do a better job of is scanning those really good matchups and just making sure that I'm not overlooking things, but not playing like Mac Jones or Andy Dalton or anything like, like that this week. So limits the guys who can really match a big ceiling from someone like Mahomes, who has been basically just mortal uh, for three straight games with 22.78 or fewer Fandle points in all of them. But those games were good for 320 yards and just one touchdown on elite efficiency that could have had more touchdown luck. Uh, 223 and one 
on the road, plus a rushing touchdown against the Bengals, who really seem to know how to like play the Chiefs the right way. So factor that in. And then 352 yards and three touchdowns against the Broncos last week on the road. That's awesome. Like, I'll take that. Um, the three picks really brought him down, but uh, otherwise, really good spot. And then my second love is going to be Dak Prescott. Might be the guy I have the most exposure to just to help me open things up salary-wise, but Jags 29th in adjusted pass defense. Prescott versus teams 22nd or worse. Um, 18.4 Fandle points, almost 260 yards per game, 1.6 touchdowns with efficiency of 0.28 passing net expected points per drop back over expectation. That's awesome. The breakout is going to come eventually. Yeah. And it could finally be uh, this week. And, and he had five carries for 24 yards last week, excluding Neil down. So yeah, the I have Dak, there. Dak is mine as well. My second love, um, the Jags pretty good against the run. Uh, as you mentioned, not very good against the pass could encourage them to be a bit more pass heavy, which is part of the reason why Dak hasn't blown up because if the Cowboys can kick your butt in the ground, they will. And they might not be as able to this week as usual. Um, I think it'll be a pretty tight script. I <laughs> bet the Jags money line um, should be a tight script, potentially high scoring game. The Cowboys might not be able to bully their way as much. So I do like Dak at 75. My first love though was Jalen Hurts. Uh, the risk here is that the Eagles could pull away from the jump, but I like Hurts regardless because they blew out the Giants last week and he still scored 30 FanDuel points. And that was with Miles Sanders going bananas as well. So Hertz might not run as much if they if they get ahead, but he should still be efficient both on the ground and through the air. I think that he has the best range of outcomes on the slate. So I want Hertz to be at the top of my pool. Probably won't get there for our head to head. I think I'll likely go Dak there to save salary uh, in order to get more more access to guys with better workloads elsewhere. But if I had if we got a lot of value like Jalen Warren, Damian Harris, I would happily, happily, happily get to Hertz at quarterback then. Running back, what do you have there? Two guys I feel really good about, uh, Derek Henry and Travis Etienne. For Henry, I'm definitely going to prioritize him this week, which if anyone's listened to the show forever, knows that's a little bit weird for me, but it's a different situation for Henry. Uh, with Dontrell Hilliard leaving early last week, Henry had a 60, or, uh, sorry, 76% snap rate, and in games with his 70% snap rate or better this year, he's averaged 24.7 carries, three targets for 146.3 scrimmage yards, with a 40% route rate and 44% of the total red zone carries or red zone opportunities. Um, he's facing the Chargers who allow 1.55 rushing yards over expectation per carry. That is 0.49 yards per carry worse than any other team. Pretty so bad. It seems good. <laughs> seems good. Uh, Travis yeah. Etienne um, facing a really good adjusted pass defense. Uh, Loris, uh, Trevor Lawrence, maybe not 100%, so they could lean on Etienne more. And in games uh, with at least half the snaps, 14.3 carries, 2.9 targets for just under 90 scrimmage yards. Okay enough. Uh, red zone opportunity share of 35% for the salary, for the game stack ability. I like that a lot. My third love is sort of contingent. You know, we might get Damian Harris without Ramondre. Might get Jalen Warren without Najee Harris. I still think I'm going to consider Daria Ogunbowale for my for my stacks with the Chiefs, but realistically, I think Alvin Kamara deserves more attention. Uh, Atlanta's average in rushing yards over expectation per carry allowed to backs, but 30th in rushing success rate allowed. Still involved, as Jim mentioned, he's faced some tough defenses. I think the path for a ceiling is still there, and the salary is low enough that. I should probably be higher on Kamara than I was at the beginning of the show. Yeah. And I think that the fact that he's had a week to like get rested, um, I know that he had that injury like way, way, way long ago, but it's possible that was still like bothering him to an extent. Um, he had the bye week to get rested. So I do think Kamara's a good tourney play. My first two loves are the same as yours, Derek Henry, Travis Etienne, because I do think it's worthwhile to spend up a running back this week, given Jacob's workload, if he's healthy, Henry's workload, the matchup that you alluded to. Henry is at 128.4 yards from scrimmage per game in 11 games since his passing game usage ticked up. And he could get more here with no Dontrell Hilliard. So likely no Dontrell Hilliard. So I think that Henry is very good. ETN, the outputs have been rough, but it's possible that's because of his foot. But the overall sample on him as a lead back is still very good. And his salary has come down like $1,000 from its peak which is quite a bit, maybe 1200. I think he might've 82 on point. Um, but you can run on Dallas a bit, 17.8 carries per game, 2.7 targets per game. 
I like ETN a lot this week. My third love, if I assume we don't get um, Najee or uh, Najee Harris out, don't get Ramondre out, I will go Deontay Foreman. Um, last week, his usage was not good. I think that's worth noting. But despite that, he still had 21 carries, a target, and 75 yards in scrimmage. He had He's had 100-plus yards in scrimmage four separate times, and for a guy at 64, that's pretty good. He's facing the Steelers. I think they should be able to remain close throughout that game, potentially Mitch Trubisky or Mason Rudolph starting for the opposing side. So I think Foreman is in play at 64. I'd prefer Harris. If we can get him, I'd prefer Jalen Warren, but I'm okay going with Foreman if I need to in order to save salary. Running back, would prefer Kamara as well at salary, um, but Foreman is in play at 64. Receiver, what you got there? C.D. Lamb. 8,100. The upside's still there. Uh, has two games of 100 plus in within his past five. Coming off of a down game, which is always fun for receiver variants. Uh, he has the best floor ceiling combo in my early simulations mm. for the week and stacks with Dak Prescott. Means I can get a Dak, Travis Etienne, CD Lamb stack without really breaking the bank. And I feel pretty good about that. Um, my second love, Chris Godwin. Now, I'm not saying that I prefer him to Mike Williams straight up, but Jim has Mike Williams in his love. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we had so much overlap. I was like, how can I at least differentiate? But Chris Godwin's like the only constant in the Buccaneers offense right now. We're going to want to have some, you know, Bengals as we talked about. So, what else do we do uh, other than Chris Godwin? I like this game enough, you know, and Godwin now has a 24% target share in three post by games for 11.7 targets per game, just the 76 yards per game, which I know Jim's going to hate on, but he does have yardage upside through volume, kind of like a lower salaried Keenan Allen. Um, he's been trending up with his efficiency. It's an, it's, we got to remember he's coming off a serious injury. He's just like the only guy I could plug in in a bring back. And I think that he's going to get 12 targets with a chance for a, a solid game and a, and a bring back. So Lower salary Keenan Allen is accurate, and that does increase my interest. I think that's a fair way to put it. So you didn't talk me into it, but you did, you did not. I'm not out, out. I'll say that. Yeah. So good job. You did. Well. I mean, I'd rather play Chris Godwin with Jamar Chase than Jamar Chase with some other receiver, like without the correlation. Like so. Christian Kirk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fair. Um, third love, I'm going, I guess I'm going two Cowboys here. Uh, Michael Gallup, 5,700. He's just the best play below uh, 6,000 at receiver. Need to save salary. So again, like just I might have two or three guys below six thousand this week, which is weird, but the studs are really studly uh, for this week. Better overall situation than what Elijah Moore's offense has. So I'm not gonna prioritize more over Gallup or Corey Davis over Gallup. He's in he's the most elite air yards value in my model uh for this week. The Jags are not particularly good. Um against receivers 25th and adjusted Fandle points per target yeah if i was on dj chark against the jags michael gallup is dj chark like in a different uniform so like why would i not be there uh gallup is also my third love 57 for the exact same reason so do love gallup my first love is jamar chase because even on thursday not knowing that if we have um jalen warren or damian harris i can still build lineups with both jamar chase and derrick henry if I'm willing to make consolations, and I am, uh, 37% target share for Chase in games with T. Higgins out or limited. I guess just limited because he hasn't, he's technically played every game so far this year, but Chase has at least 12 targets in all of those. He's had 129, 129 yards, 50 yards, and 119. So one clunker, but still, this offense is clicking better now than it was earlier on this year. So Chase, I think, at um, 9,000 well worth that salary. My second love is Mike Williams because the Titans cornerback play is the weak spot of their offense or the weak spot of their defense. It's a pretty solid bring back for Henry lineups at a lower salary, just six targets for Williams in his first game back, but a lot of yards while facing uh coverage from Xavier Howard. They're playing indoors. He makes big plays. Mike will back in the menu this week. And then Michael Gallup was my third love tight end. What you doing there? I'm going to prioritize Travis Kelsey this week. Uh, if you build around Dak, you can still build like Dak, Henry, ETN, Kelsey stacks without completely punting all of your receiver spots. It's doable. Um, the Texans have faced just 85 tight end targets, which is around average at this point in the year, but they've allowed the highest target per route rate to the position. How does that happen? They've basically played nobody 
at tight end with the Pauls. Or, like, they've played the Titans, but that was before Oconquo was, like, you know, elevated to a, a bigger role. The guys that they did play, there's really been two. Dallas Goddard and Dalton Schultz. Uh, Goddard had 100 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Schultz had 10 targets and 87 yards. I think that this is an eruption spot waiting to happen for Kelsey, who hasn't done it in a few weeks. And if he does, we're going to need that. So I think that everything lines up for Kelsey this week. Second love, Cole Komet. Definitely stacks on the bring back side of Hertz, uh, but also like Devontae. I'm not going to do a Goddard Komet like double tight end stack or anything. But uh, when I do play Justin Fields, it's going to be tied fairly often uh, to Komet. The target shares in single games are, are elevated 20% or more in five straight. Uh, and the last time we saw Justin Fields threw for a season high in passing yards, ran at a season low rate. I don't know how much that'll stick, but Komet at 53 makes a lot of sense. He was my second love too. I think the only downside of Komet is that he kind of looks like Max Verstappen. So I kind of like, kind of punchable. Um, but seven targets in that one game without Darnell Mooney. He's had yardage upside. Um, obvious bring back for Jalen Hurts lineups. I think there's a lot of lo- lots like there. My first love though is actually that same game, which means I can't stack them because I don't want to go two tight ends. But I do like Dallas Goddard at six thousand. I'm guessing people will probably not be there in his first game back. But he was talking in the locker room like a week or two ago about how he was ready to go for this game, which means I don't think he'll be super limited for this one. Uh, people probably won't roster him because he has an IR tag uh, next to him until 4 p.m. on Saturday. So I think $6,000 for a crazy efficient tight end in a good game on an offense I like a lot. I think that's uh, pretty fun for me. Defense. Enlighten me. What you got? I got the Broncos. Uh, they might be the best value in my model all year at defense. Um, the highest that I can remember. They're going to be chalky, and you have to worry about that a little bit with defense. But you can differentiate where you want. I think the Jets work, the Bengals, Chargers, Falcons, puntable as well. But um, you can talk to me about the Broncos as well here. Yeah, Broncos, my favorite at 37. I think they're like my the default one I put in. If I yeah. want to save some salary, I am okay going down to the Falcons, who you alluded to. Okay with the Chargers, as you mentioned as well. Um, Bengals, they're actually a decent number of defenses below 4,000 this week. Raiders against screaming Mac Jones. Um, can you imagine if anyone else were like screaming at their offensive coordinator the way Mac Jones is? The discourse we'd be having around it. It's so annoying to me. Anyway, um, so Raiders at 39 in play. Jets at 41 in play. So I just stole your list. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Panthers at 42 as well. Did you say them? No, I, okay, I cut it off with the Jets. There we go. But I think they're all in play. Spend down a defense this week because we actually have decent options for doing so. Any final thoughts for you, Brandon, before we close up the show for this week? Uh, keep an eye on the news. Um, see what value opens up. This feels like one of those slates where we're going to, we talked for an hour and a half about the slate and then we're going to get no Najee or like, no Ramondre or something else weird that happens. And please, right. So <laughs> I pray. And, and that will change a lot. Um, yeah. If we don't, you know, you have to make concessions and maybe you do end up going a little bit more balanced. But I think that the studs are worth chasing this week. And yeah. I'm okay with a little bit less uh, perfect value uh, for this 100%. week to make that happen. 100% same with me. Um, and if you have questions about like guys, feel free to tweet us. I don't know if Brandon will check his Twitter, but like, <laughs> I'll check my Twitter oh, on Sunday. Don't sign me up for that. Yeah, yeah, I'll check it. So you can tweet at me. I'll try. Um, and I'll answer questions. If you have questions about like value plays that pop up, stuff like that, more than happy to take questions on Sunday morning. But that is all that we have here for today. We'll be back with you once again Monday to recap it all. Final recap show of the year because the holiday is coming up, uh, the end of the season coming up. So get that by subscribing to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and a review as well. Brandon, if people have questions for you on Twitter, where can they find you there? I'm on Twitter at Gadula13, G-D-U-L-A-1-3. And I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you with your DFS lineups in week 15. We'll talk to you once again Monday for the final recap podcast of the year. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast powered by Number Fire. 